Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Wonderful to see you on this most important day in the life of the Christian church. We are an open, vibrant, inclusive church, welcoming all people of goodwill. If you're a visitor, we're very glad you're with us today. And if you're hoping to deepen your spiritual life, we hope you'll think about becoming a part of our community of faith. Following worship this morning, there will be an Easter egg hunt out on the lawn for everyone up through the fifth grade. It starts promptly at 1015. I suspect it will conclude by 1016. <laughs> So don't be late. Our deacons are providing a delicious Easter breakfast this morning. It's free and open to all. It will be right after this morning service up until 11 o'clock. The flowers on both sides of the cross are given in loving memory of Nick Markopoulos by Kathy Higgins. We're also grateful for everyone who donated all these beautiful lilies. They do have a designated home our deacons will be taking them out to retirement facilities, to people who are ill, to people who've lost loved ones recently over the last couple of days. Thank you for donating those lilies. We express our sympathy this morning to the family of Margie Lounsbury, who died this past week. I've always thought that when it is my time, I hope that I go sometime near Easter. I think that would be very fitting. Camilla and I had the privilege of serving communion to Margie just recently and enjoyed a talk with her. She mind was very bright. She recently turned 105. Please note the upcoming educational events that are in the back page of your bulletin. Um, also, a couple of concerts coming in May and June. We are very grateful for today's musicians the Philadelphia Brass, Harvey Price on timpani, and Ted Barr will be assisting on the piano. Right now, let's start this Easter service by sharing the peace of Christ with one another.
Resurrection begins with the cry of grief, then moves to the confusion of an empty tomb. The Christ is alive. Yes, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Uh -huh. join our voices together in our Easter prayer, praying, Forgive us, O God, if in the perplexity of this day the musings of the church should become too simple, 
Let the sound of our hymns echo the wonder of the women who saw the empty tomb and remembered what they had been taught. In the mystery of this day, let the voice of the church not succumb to timidity. Let the sound of our proclamation echo the testimony of bewildered disciples who found good news to speak. After the pageantry of this day, let our memory of your love not fade or grow weary. Let the content of our prayers reflect the fragile yet faithful confidence of saints and martyrs who worshiped before us. In the name of the risen Christ we pray. Amen. I'd like for the children to come forward and join me up front. Let's see, I think we better get over in this way since we've got the table on the floor. Let's be right in this area. Come on over here, guys. Happy Easter! It's wonderful for you to be here this morning on the most important day in the Christian church. We're so glad you are here. Well, I'm going to tell you a story. Once upon a time, come on up. They are coming from the rafters. They are coming from... Great. Come on up and sit down. Yep. Once upon a time, a teacher was telling her class the Easter story. And she told them about how Jesus had died, was put in the tomb, but then God raised Jesus from the dead for new life. She told all of her students that she wanted them to think about the Easter story, and so she gave each student a plastic Easter egg. And she said, take this home and come back tomorrow with something inside of it that shows new life. So the next day, the students came back to class. She asked one little girl to open her egg. She opened up her egg, and inside her egg was a flower. Easter happens in the spring when we have all these beautiful flowers popping up, and they are great signs of new life. She asked a little boy what was in his egg. He opened his up, and inside was a caterpillar. Because a caterpillar turns into a beautiful butterfly. And that's a beautiful sign of new life, too. And then she asked a little girl to open her egg. See the egg? The little girl opened her egg, and inside was absolutely nothing. And the teacher said, why do you have an egg with nothing in it? And she said, because after Jesus died, the tomb was empty. And so this is the best sign of Easter, that God raised him to new life. After our prayer, I'm going to give all of you a plastic Easter egg. Take it home, put things in it, play with it. But just remember, whenever it's absolutely empty, that's like the tomb of Jesus after God raised Jesus from the dead. Let's all have a prayer together. Dear God, Thank you for the empty tomb and for giving us new life. Amen. All right, let me give you all an egg. Thanks. Great. Here we go. Let's take an egg. And good luck on the Easter egg hunt when you go outside this morning. Here we go. Take one. Here we go. Everybody get one? Get one? There we go. Here we go. Boop, boop. Great. Grab one.
This morning's sermon text comes from the Gospel of John. It's a very familiar story of the resurrection as John tells it. He writes, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple, whom scholars believe is John, the author of this gospel, set out and went to the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Isn't that an odd detail? They were running to the tomb, but Peter lost the race. <laughs> okay, John, you're faster. <laughs> the other disciple, John, bent down, looked in, and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head not lined with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, okay, John, we got it, you won, <laughs> also went in, and he saw and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb, weeping. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, Tell me where you laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said in Aramaic, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, 
Do not touch me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go and tell my brothers, and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them all the things that he said to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Presbyterian pastor Kate Murphy notes that it is a maxim among literary scholars that if you take into account all of the novels, all of the short stories, all of the fairy tales, and all of the poems in the world, there are only seven stories. Overcoming the Monster, Rags to Riches, The Quest, Voyage and Return, Comedy, Tragedy, and Rebirth. However, Murphy says there are really only two stories and infinite variations of them. There is the story of the fall and the story of redemption. We might say it another way. There is the story of the crucifixion and the story of the resurrection. There is the story of Good Friday and there is the story of Easter Sunday. There is the story that is told by the powers and principalities that are passing away. And there is the story of the eternal kingdom of God. There are only two stories. And we become the one we believe. The Nigerian poet and novelist Ben Okri says, one way or another, we are living the stories planted into, in us early or along the way. We are also living the stories that we plant in ourselves. We live the stories that either give our lives meaning or we negate it with meaninglessness. If we change the stories, we change our lives. Easter is the day we realize that God has changed the story. Today's text from the Gospel of John informs us that very early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. If you have lost a loved one, you may have had the experience of waking up well before sunrise and not being able to go back to sleep. You lie there in bed and you replay the painful event over and over in your mind until you finally stumble out of bed. Well, after replaying the nightmare a hundred times, Mary Magdalene finally crawled out of bed and walked to the tomb where the body of Jesus had been placed on Friday. Was she going there because she still couldn't believe it was true? Grief includes a really big piece of denial. Maybe she didn't believe it still. Or maybe she was going there to show her final respects and to say goodbye. Have you ever visited the spot where a loved one has been put to rest just to talk to him or her? To say, I love you. I treasure the life we had together. Thank you for picking me up when I fell. Thank you for teaching me how to treat people, for forgiving me when I wasn't my best self, for showing me what's important in life. Perhaps that's why Mary went to the tomb. She wanted to talk to Jesus. And because that wound was still so blistering raw, maybe she marched to the tomb to have it out with him. 
Why did you have to push so hard? Why couldn't you have toned down your message and proceeded slower? Why did you have to get yourself killed? Whatever prompted her to trek to the tomb that morning, nothing was as she had expected. She had seen the men seal the tomb on Friday, but now that mammoth stone had been pushed aside. She ran as rapidly as her exhausted legs would carry her. She ran to Peter and the other disciple and blurted out her interpretation of what she had witnessed. They have taken our Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Mary's assumption is that the authorities have concocted yet another way to sully the reputation of their leader and to poke a finger in the eye of his followers. They've snatched the body. Peter and the other disciples react by speeding to the tomb. When they arrive, they peer inside, and all they can see are linen wrappings. They are either bewildered or convinced that Mary is right because the text says only the disciples return to their homes. In the meantime, Mary has trudged back to the tomb. Tears stream down her face as she stares inside the empty cavern. She is startled to see two messengers, one sitting at where the head of Jesus was, one at the feet. They question Mary, why are you weeping? She repeats her assessment, because someone has taken his body. Then, you know this feeling, you sense that someone is standing behind you. She pivots, and through the early morning haze and tear-filled eyes, she sees a figure. Imagining him to be the gardener, she asks if he has taken the body, and he replies, Mary. She realizes who it is. It is her beloved Jesus. He tells her to instruct his disciples that he is risen. Mary bolts from the garden and locates the disciples. She makes the announcement that changes the world. I have seen the Lord. Tom Long notes that on one of his Prairie Home Companion shows, Garrison Keeler quipped, Never say anything bad about a man until you've walked a mile in his shoes. By then, you're a mile away, you've got his shoes, and you can say whatever you want. <laughs> now, the humor springs up because what we believe is to be an inspirational advice about developing empathy for someone turns out to be just a crass, self-centered cynicism. The contradictory words do not belong on the same page, and so they collide. The world of moral vision runs into the flat earth logic of the utterly utilitarian and amoral, and the shock of laughter erupts. Well, Easter, in a much more profound way, involves a collision of contradictory worlds. The world of inevitable death and cemeteries and women sadly walking to the tomb, a world of fixed limits and low horizons, thrown into sudden juxtaposition with the world of the risen Jesus. Full of life, full of joyful blessings, full of assurances, do not be afraid. 
The resurrection of Jesus is the unexpected jolt that contradicts all expectations. We think we have it all figured out. We know the way things work. Nothing lasts forever. Everything perishes. When you're dead, you're dead. End of story. But the resurrection of Jesus is a divine act of defiance against the powers of death. Brian Blount, former president of Union Seminary in Richmond and a former Westminster speaker, says, the statistics say death wins every single time. The resurrection says, hold on. Not so fast. When Jesus was put to death, it appeared that the Jesus movement had been stopped cold. Not deterred, not interrupted, but terminated along with its leader. And not only did the Romans and the temple authorities believe that silencing Jesus would silence his followers, but his followers believed it too. On Friday afternoon when Jesus was killed, they took off running. They hid. They were afraid the authorities might come after them. Yet within a short time after abandoning Jesus and with Peter denying him, something life-altering transformed them. Something filled them with such courage that nothing, absolutely nothing, could deter them from proclaiming that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Most of the original 12 would be eventually martyred because of their stubborn faith in the resurrection. What could have so radically transformed them if not appearances of Jesus after he died? A colleague tells of a recent interview with a Ukrainian pastor named Ivan Rusin. Rusin talked about the constant terror and uncertainty of life in his country. But he also said that the conflict helped his church to hammer out its vocation. The church has worked to meet people in their need providing them with food and fuel and a space for lament. His people have developed a remarkable generosity and a new grit that he says is astounding. In his own life, Rusin has or agonized over prayers unanswered over his anger at the violence and all the suffering. But then he said something surprising. He said, I will continue to follow Jesus even if I do not understand. Will I survive? Will my family survive? I will follow anyway. Somehow, during this year, my relationship with God has become more real. Something has gripped Rusin and his church. They are being transformed amidst their grief and the very real horror of evil. And yet, they have hope. Somehow, he says, he cannot explain it, but it is true. It is a future hope that is changing life in the present. There are two stories. The story of the crucifixion, and the story of the resurrection. 
the story of Good Friday, and the story of Easter morning, the story of despair, and the story of hope. And you become the story you believe. grateful for the countless blessings of life, physical life, spiritual life, 
beautiful creation, loving family and friends. We return our thanks with our morning tithes and offerings. We unite our hearts and minds in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we are deeply grateful that you have given us the chance to have lives of joy thanks to Christ rising from the dead. In his victory over death, you revealed yourself as a God of transformation who is ceaselessly working to bring good out of evil, justice out of oppression, peace out of strife, and hope out of despair. Through all the stunning peaks and lonely valleys of our lives, we pray that our faith in the resurrection may live within us as a mighty source of strength and guidance and confidence. Comforting God, we pause to pray for those for whom the proclamation of victory over death sounds faint or unbelievable. We pray for the innocents in our country and across the globe whose lives have been torn apart by violence, loss, prejudice, or poverty. We pray for the lost, for the lonely, 
for those who struggle with illness of body, mind, or spirit. May all who suffer and all who grieve find in you courage in their nightmare of darkness. And may Christ's resurrection be a steadfast source of comfort that heightens their hope in your promise of new life. Loving God, we pray for those within our church family who are ill, for those facing a severe test, and for those who've lost a loved one. We pray for your healing spirit that all who are in need of a friend or a good medical report or something positive to look forward to may find health, wholeness, and a firm resolve. May they be touched by the Easter hope of new life. Eternal God, when the constant drumbeat of death, injustice, and despair threaten to make us cynical or depressed, we pray that you will replenish our spirits with courage to resist evil and to trust in your resurrection power. We pray that you deepen our commitment to faithfully follow the example of Jesus so that your light and love may shine through us. O oh God, we seek out joy in our time with family and friends. And may we find delight in the laughter and energy of children. And may we open our eyes to the beauty of spring and see it as just one more example of your transforming love. This and all things we pray in the name of the Prince of Peace, who taught us to pray together as a family, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
has lost its sting. Believe in the hope of the resurrection. And may God's blessing be upon you, those you love, and those only God loves, now and forever. Amen. Thank you.